You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Srivasa Prakash. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today, we've got Christian Shivajodi, who is well known as the head of the FX prop desk at Goldman Sachs, which he ran for about 13 years. And then he founded his own hedge fund uh, called Semper Macro and retired from full-time trading about seven years ago. So thank you so much for being on the podcast, Christian. It's awesome having you. It's a pleasure to be here, Sri. Thank you. So first off, I wanted to start by asking you to sort of give us, you know, your background of number one, how you became a prop trader and, you know, your journey uh, to you know, where you are today? Um, well, I never intended to be, become a prop trader. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was finishing my degree, was interviewing um, with, a, with, a, with a bunch of places, actually, and also applied to the LSC to go to do some postgraduate work. And I guess things, I mean, we're, we're talking 1987, so things were probably before <laughs> you were born and actually before a lot of your, your listeners are probably born. Um, things were pretty different in those days. The banks used to do, um, well, they used to do presentations, which of course they still do, but they, they used to ply you with a lot of alcohol and food and stuff. So it was very popular for students to go to the, um, the bank presentations, frankly, just to get a free drink or free drinks. And there was a group of us used to do this, and I, I was at one of them. Um, and it was it was Citibank, and I was chatting to a to one of the guys there, you know. And he said, "Well, you know, what uh, what do you want to do in foreign exchange?" I didn't even know what foreign exchange was, and and, and I said, I, <laughs> "I don't really know." I said, "I'm just here predominantly for the drinks." And he thought it was he thought it was quite funny, and invited me onto the trading floor um, a week or so later. And you know, and it was these were the days when um, computers had literally, I think, eight eight bit computers were, were were just around things like the Commodore sixty four. You know, Apple really hadn't taken off for those making stuff, but the the trading was was all voice. It was people phoning up, women on teletypers or blokes on teletypers, um, and calling out prices. So it was very it was it was very visual. It was very oral. Um, and it just looked like a fun place to work. So, you know, I, I wish I could say they, they offered me a job there and then they didn't. I had to apply, um, went through a grueling process. This was actually the first graduate intake that Citibank had ever hired for foreign exchange. And um, I did, I ended up getting the job and joined the, uh, actually we went to the London Business School. They sent us on, on an actually really quite intensive training course for three months and started in October 1987, a week, the week of the crash, in fact. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite an introduction to the world of, uh, of trading. Although, having said that, interesting enough, the FX markets didn't move a great deal. The fixed income markets were all over the place. But um, mm -hmm. I was actually sitting on one of the, the, the prop desks. At, they didn't really have a prop desk, but they had the closest thing they had to it at that point. But I ended up moving to... Um, doing forward cable, which is, it's really an interest rate product group. It's, um, it's part of the FX business, but it is very much uh, an interest rate product. So that was, I was at City for, oh, I don't know, two or three years. And then I was approached by Goldman Sachs, I think in 90, 90 or 91, I can't remember. I think it was probably 90 originally to, um, to come and work on their, specials desk actually um uh, which i turned down and the guy who ran the business at that point chap very nice chap called mike o'brien came back about six months later and uh, offered me a job in the in the prop group which is what i wanted to do and uh, and i went over so that was my start at gs got it and 
what was life like at Goldman, especially, you know, back in the day? And, you know, a lot of people, when they read back at these stories of, you know, people taking big risks at Goldman, you know, it's sort of really exciting at the same time, kind of really scary. So I want to ask you, you know, what was life like, you know, back then when you were working at Goldman? Um, it was very different back then, certainly to, to how it was when I left. Um, you know, a, 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 I'll sort of go around your, your question a little bit and how to compare it to Citibank, who, who actually, they, Citibank were one of the biggest players in foreign exchange at the time, um, pretty aggressive. Um, but it was it was nothing compared to GS. And then in, interestingly enough, you know, GS, um, we always felt from the trading perspective somewhat inferior to Salomon Brothers, who were considered the real big swingers out there. Um, but the order of magnitude of positions was 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 actually pretty immense. I think you know, I think if you I, say I've been running a position of ten units at at City. Um, the equivalent of GS for, for someone of my seniority would have been you know, somewhere between 100 to 250. And as you've got more senior positions, it's got bigger and bigger. Um, it was it was still it was a private company. I think it was actually it was the largest private company in the world at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a partnership. Um, and it was it wasn't a limited liability partnership. It was a full liability partnership. So you know, to put that in perspective, if that firm blew up, the, the partners were going to lose everything. There was no, your house is safe. <laughs> they, 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 they were in it for, for everything. I mean, that were, clearly that changed over time. But at that point, it, for me, it's interesting because it's, you know, I think it almost certainly gave everyone a much greater focus. Certainly, if you were a partner, you were, you were very, very focused on risk. Although there was no particular... I wouldn't say any kind of sophisticated risk system, no, no VAR numbers in the early days. We, we, we did progress onto that. Um, so it was, yeah, it, it was a very different environment. Certainly the group, I originally joined actually the J. Aaron Group, which was their commodities trading arm. Um, and there were big reorganizations within GS. And over time, I, I moved from Aaron into FIC, which is fixed income currencies and commodities. And it was actually, Ultimately, it was post 93, 94, I think, post 94, where um, I started running. It's, it was actually, it wasn't just FX, it was fixed income currencies and a little bit of commodities, actually. We generally, we only traded um, liquid products. Um, and actually, one of the things that I did when I took over the group in, I think it was 94, is <clears throat> we went off balance sheet. Um, you know, we were trading a lot of cash bonds and cash products and a of course, you have to you have to put up a lot of collateral to trade those things, if if not the entire collateral. Um, going off balance sheet, essentially trading FX um, and derivatives, we were we were suddenly levered. Now, if you made money, that was great. And as um, as, as as we've just seen recently, Josh, <laughs> <laughs> if you lose money, it's not so great, and it can be it it can be pretty painful very very quickly. Right. Especially with the you know the Bill Huang collapse, and I believe I saw that he had about what a hundred billion dollars that he lost within a few days. So it, it it is pretty crazy when you think about it. And you know, I wanted to ask you while you were at Goldman, could you say could you share some of your sort of your you know favorite stories or favorite experiences while you were there? Um, hmm, I have to be a bit careful. Although I left a long time ago now, so probably not as careful as I otherwise would be. Um. I mean, there are actually so many funny stories. I mean, one of the, in the early days, um, I, I used to sit next to quite an experienced. He was a he's from the states, and he just joined the firm. And I was uh, I was trading I, think I was trading notional no French French government bonds basically, and he saw me by by a hundred or two hundred. I can't remember what exact amount was. And he he leaned across and said, "Christian, did I just see you buying?" 200 notionals and I, I said yeah and he goes he goes I've been, I've been in this business for 30 years and I've never had a position larger than 20. And I said well actually my, my position isn't 200 I said it's a couple of thousand and <laughs> this guy's you know light light went off and uh, he he started he upped his risk dramatically and actually the the story leads on to a literally I think just a few weeks later um, 
It was in the big bond uh, bull market in 93. But I, he clicks into, we had these broker boxes. Again, it was, this is pretty old technology. You had these speaker boxes, you'd have a phone and you'd, you'd pick up the phone and you'd say to the guy, you know, buy 200 notionals, 300 notionals, whatever. And he clicked in and said, buy, he just said, buy notionals. And you could, over the box, the guy shouts back, how many do you want me to buy? And Larry just clicks straight back in and he goes, goes, you just keep buying. I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> but um, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a very easy atmosphere. I mean, you know, the great thing about GS in those days was they, they knew you had to make mistakes to learn and they let you make those mistakes. And as long as you learned from them, it was fine. But they, you know, they, they were happy taking losses as long as it wasn't consistent and, and you learned something from it. It was, um, it was from a, from a experience perspective, it was absolutely fantastic. There were, you know, there were, and there were great mentors. They were very focused on, on, getting people to, to learn about their products outside of the products. Um, you know, you could travel as much as you wanted. You know, I used to spend a lot of time in Asia. They, I mean, to the point, you know, they'd, they'd say, take your wife with you and they'd pay first class and stuff just to get you out of the office and to Hong Kong or Tokyo. And, and the odd thing was that a lot of people didn't want to travel. I used to go everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so it was basically traveling at the expense of Goldman, which, you know, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, but you had to work at the other end. So it was, you know, it wasn't a complete boondoggle. I mean, my wife enjoyed it. And I think she, she uh, spent, had a lot of time out having fun. But, you know, once you got there, it was up at seven in the morning and, and there were long hours. And I said it was a very tight knit group. Uh, and, and the prop guys in, in particular, obviously we had New York office, London, uh, Tokyo, we had Hong Kong briefly. So, and, and we traded 24 hours, you know, five and a half days a week, basically it was, um, but it was fun. I was the, uh, you know, most of the time it was fun. Um, and, and they were interesting times, you know, we, you know, you just mentioned, um, Arch Goss, or however it's pronounced is, you know, levered 10 to one. We had, uh, thinking back in 2000, I think it was LTCM, they were levered 30 to one, um, mm. You know, though, and and actually, their blow up was a a lot more impressive than than the one we've just seen. So, you know, this stuff has happened before, and it happened between LTCM and and recently, and it's going to happen again. It's just one of those recurring themes. You know, history history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, and it's it it astounds me actually, given the the level of risk management that something like that is can happen. You know, but. Hey, you know, people greed drives um, people to do very, very odd things. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, one of the trades that you mentioned in your interview with Stephen Chobney in the book Inside the House of Money was uh, you were along the pound and short the yen. So, and you described that as sort of the trade that you learned the most from your most educational trade because, you know, you lost a bit of money on it. So could you talk about the lessons that you learned from it? Yeah, you know, whether it was the trade I learned the most from, I'm not sure. It was certainly the trade that was the sing the most painful. Um, and, you know, the, the, the simple lesson was, was actually incredibly simple. You know, li li liquidity is the single most important thing in, in prop trading. Um, and by that, I mean, you have to be able to exit a position. And you have to be able to exit it quickly, which actually, you know, there's the lesson again with Arch Goss is that it's they, they simply couldn't get out of those positions. They they own so much of it. They were pushing the market against themselves and against Credit Suisse and Amura and so on and so forth. I had been I'd been long. I'd been short Sterling Yen, actually, the previous year, 93. Um, and it was a, it was a large negative carry trade actually to be short sterling in interest rates. I think we were around thirteen percent or so at the time. Oh. Um, um, certainly double digits. I'm not quite sure. I'd have to go and go back and have a look. But um, and and it was a trade that worked worked fantastically well. It was a mixture of cash and options. And I started getting a little bit cocky. Actually, I started selling options, short dated options, only one week and two weeks, but to mitigate my time decay. 
94, I decided actually that the carry had, had become so great and the pound had become so weak that I'd flipped the position. Um, so not only did I start going long sterling yen, I also I bought sterling yen calls and then I started selling some short dated sterling yen puts. Um, long story short, you know, the market always finds you. It, sterling, sterling yen went up initially, <clears throat> I think for the first four or five weeks of the year, and then it started collapsing. It was to do, it was political, it was to do with the Americans having an argument with the Japanese. It was a mixture actually, I think, of, uh, of the, the yen strengthening because of a, a car parts um, trade war with the US. And mm -hmm. then inflation started uh, going up in the UK, so the pound started collapsing. I, you know, I sold out of my cash position relatively quickly, um, but, all of a sudden those puts that I was short were just, the, as I was selling, I was just getting longer and longer. And um, and the loss kept on getting bigger and bigger. And I, I finally had to, you know, I, I bailed, um, but it was a big loss. It was a big loss and um, I had to wear it. It was early in the year. Um, the firm, for some, well, for some strange reason, didn't fire me on the spot. And actually that was quite, uh, a funny story the the head very nice chap he's he's retired a long time ago called me in and asked me you know what i'd done and i i said look i've i've uh, i've cut the position and i fully expected to be fired i mean we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in losses and uh, and i i said to him what do you want me to do and he said well he goes um you know i, I think I think firing you would be a waste of money, Christian. No, he started off by saying, do you know how much it costs to train a US fighter pilot? And I thought, what the hell's this got to do with? Anyway, he, he's, I think at the time he said it was about two and a half million dollars. And he goes, and we've just spent a lot more on you. And he goes, so <laughs> I, I don't intend to let you go at this point. But so it was, yeah, I mean, that, you know, the, 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 the real lesson was, interestingly enough, you know, never, be short options and unless they're covered um and from that always make sure you have liquidity you know i, I from that point on i basically never sold an option unless it was um covered and i actually spent a lot of time it's generally not a particularly profitable way to trade but i did look for anomalies where buying short dated options seem to make sense and actually if you time them properly they can be very very lucrative you know if, you, if you're getting devaluation stuff like that and of course that immediately throws the problem to someone else and again we've seen that again recently with GameStop and stuff like that you know you do not want to get caught on the wrong side of a liquidity trap because yeah if, if something gaps over a weekend and, and you're short that option you're toast um, you want to be the guy holding that option. Um, and because we were running pretty large positions, um, liquidity was incredibly important. So we only really traded the most liquid products, you know, US Treasury bonds, um, dollar yen, <clears throat> cable, in those days, dollar mark. Um, yeah, and, and with a lot more focus on, on risk management. Got it. And, you know, as so, you talk, and I haven't forgotten to this day. Yeah. And, you know, as you, as you mentioned, you know, talking about shorting options, you know, one, uh, one of the trades that's similar to, you know, being short gamma is the carry trade, which, you know, you don't like. So could you sort of explain, well, what the, what the profile of a carry trade is and, you know, why you, you don't really like it? Um, again, I can only speak from, you know, from my time but then we had um, emerging markets desks and, and I over over the years I've been doing this for 33 years you would I'd see the same profile over and over again you know a, a youngish guy would come in he'd buy the South African rand because it, the interest rates were 14 15 16 percent and it'd be long rand short yen he was getting a you know twelve percent pickup carry, and and that trade would work for a year, two years, three years, boom, and then it would blow up. Usually, somewhere between year three and five, and the blow up was always more impressive than those incremental gains. And that was again, that's the, that was the story of LTCM, you know. And I, anyone who doesn't know that story, there's some great books on it actually. 
Um, but that's essentially, you know, they, these were they had Nobel laureates there. They they were they had the smartest guys from Salomon Brothers, and they were smart. But they were levered thirty to one. They were picking up pennies in front of the steamroller. And when the liquidity dried up and they needed to get out, they just simply couldn't. And and that was, I mean, that wind up or loss was so large, the Fed had to intervene. I mean, you know, and they, they, they organized uh, uh, the largest banks to bail them out basically. So, um, I'm trying to think, so what the question was? Yeah, so could you sort of explain, you know, why a carry Ooh. trade is carry trade? Yeah, yeah. Um, as you said, it, it, it's you know they're synthetic short gamma trades, and it just goes back to liquidity. You do not want to be in something illiquid, and the moment you start getting involved in these, whereas the Ar Argentine or in the South African rand, or you know, I, I know some of these countries don't exist anymore, but they did then. Um, you know, we've had Hungarian, Florent, uh, they, they were popular traits until they weren't basically. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it goes back to my 94 blow up, you know, liquidity is the most important thing. And in fact, a carry trade puts you on the other side of that. Um, and in fact, you know, we spend a lot of time looking for potential devals. Um, I'd say they're quite difficult to catch, probably easier back then because of course we didn't have the euro. There was there was a there was a lot more currencies to, to trade basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it might have been a bit of a rambling answer. I apologize. It does. And so I wanted to move to another thing, uh, which was you know, today, you know, there, there is a lot of, you know, information about trading online. So do you think that the probability of becoming a successful self-sufficient trader has gone up as a result of, you know, people having access to more information or, you know, do you think it's gotten a lot harder? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't, I'll answer it this way. If the number of people who are now trading has gone up, which your question kind of implies that, then my guess would be that the percentage of successful ones will be remains the same. Um, you know, I know you had uh, you had Peter Brandt on um, mm -hmm. some months ago, and um, I was having this actually Peter was having this conversation with with, with a, a course he was teaching in America. And someone asked something similar. And actually, Peter, came out and I'd done some work on this actually and showed the chart and it was something along the lines of your, your chances of being a now how we define success I'm not quite sure but of being a very successful trader was was less than being I think either a professional footballer in the Premier League but I, and I think he also used um, something you know the I'm not too familiar with baseball in the US and stuff like that so it's there are a lot of people who do it. There are very few people who do it consistently like Peter with pretty amazing results. Um, so it's tough. You know, I mean, the group, you know, I, I, back in the 80s and 90s, actually, we were a tight-knit group at GS, but I actually knew most of the guys at Solomon's as well. Um, and, and these were small groups. I mean, globally... The GS prop group didn't have more than 13 people. It may, may have been 14 or 15, but generally we were around 10 to 13 people. Um, right. You know, and that was weird. People like Morgan Stanley had a desk, but they didn't take a lot of risk. Um, so again, it depends how you're going to define, is, is success your percentage returns, which is fine, or is it the absolute value of returns consistently? So, um, but I still think it's, it's tough you know, even to get the, the percentage returns consistently. Um, now I've been out of the business effectively for seven, eight, nine years. Um, you know, and even when I was in the hedge fund world, okay, towards the end, you know, you, you, you follow other people's performance very closely. Um, and it's, it's tough. You know, I had a tough time running a hedge fund. That's one of the reasons I got out of it. It was, it was difficult to to, to, to beat, you know, to, to have those percentage returns repeatedly. 
and I'm a particularly volatile trader and it's, I think my style of trading was less appropriate to a hedge fund um, environment than it certainly was to a prop desk. Now I, I told my investors that and, um, and, and they were aware of it, but um, and I'd actually dialed down the risk, the, the volatility to, to a large degree actually. But you know, this is, it's that, that's tough, you know, I was suddenly dealing with 200 investors instead of one. Um, mm -hmm. and that's a different type of pressure. Right. And, you know, one of the things that you, that you mentioned in, you know, in, uh, inside the house of money was that, you know, there, uh, there were on average three or four you know, massive, you know, macro opportunities every single year. And, you know, if you caught wind of three or four of them, you probably had a pretty excellent year. And, you know, when we were, uh, you know, chatting off record, you know, you said that that's not true anymore. And, you know, do you think that there is any reason for the, for this lack of opportunity or, you know, has there been any, or what has caused the change in, you know, macro as a whole? Well, I, I, you know, macro is evolutionary. It's changing all the time. It changed over the 30 years I was involved in it. And to go back, you know, I think I say that there are usually three or four, um, great opportunities a year and i'd say now if you caught three or four of them you're probably a liar <laughs> it's, a, it's highly unlikely now you know let, let's let's look at last year there probably were well there, there were two great trades last year you know there was there was the beginning of covid and the market collapse and there was the the classic Inflation. classic yeah Fed response. Now there were two. If you caught those two, I tell you, you know, you're you're looking at double digit returns and and a and a pretty happy. So they, I think the nature has changed. And of course, last year is a pretty extreme example. But but to go back to your question, what what I think has changed is the amount of automated trading that's going on. Um, momentum, which certainly in in the late eighties, early nineties, and currencies was 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 classic and i i don't see that anymore you know these days you people are looking at hourly charts you know the, the days when people looked at dailies and weekly seems to me to have gone and i you know I, I look at the charts occasionally and i just think it's it's these thousands of of a logarithmic trading you know some looking at 30 seconds some looking at five minutes some looking at an hour some looking at four hours and i think that's taking a lot of momentum out of the markets. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily bad, but it just means you have to adapt and your, your style to cope with that. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old dog, you know, and the old dog new tricks thing. I don't feel the need to, 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 to engage anymore in those types of markets, but uh, technology has, has changed it, you know, and it will change again, you know, with the, the backdrop will change. Well, something will come along, you know, whether it's um, legal changes, um, you know, we had Dodd-Frank, which took a lot of prop desks out, but those guys just went to hedge funds. So, you know, and the hedge funds have been growing we've had up and down, but generally yeah. they've, they've continued to grow. So, um, but, you know, again, talking about crises, you know, there do seem to be fewer of them. You know, I did, I think before this, I just had a quick flip through. I was quite intrigued, actually. And, you know, oh, there was the Russian crisis and the, the ruble devaluation in 97. There was, um, sorry, that was the Asian crisis in 97. Russia was 98. Um, you know, 2000, we had Y2K and the LTCM blow up. Um, I, it, was, it just seemed to be every year there was there was something happening, and and that isn't it tends to be you know we looked at Yasta COVID that was a global phenomenon it wasn't country specific, um, so that, that that that's a nuance that is different now I think so but like I said I I think I just means the opportunities are different they're not they're not better they're not worse. Got it. And, you know, when we were, and, you know, one, one thing that you mentioned at the start of this answer was, you know, what happened with COVID and the initial move down. And again, when we were speaking off record, you said that, you know, that was not a black swan event and that was something, you know, people could, you know, catch the move down and, you know, you were able to do it. So could you sort of explain, number one, 
why it was not a black swan. And the second thing is, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind sharing you know, how you found the idea and how you actually traded it? Okay, well, you know, black swan event, I, I believe, and I don't know if Taleb, if this was Taleb's description or, or someone describing Taleb. <laughs> but, yeah. It's, it's, it's a black swan event is not is a parachutist jumping out and his parachute doesn't open. That is not a black swan event because we know the probability of that happening. And it's, you know, I'll pick a number off the top of my head. It's one and parachutes sometimes just don't open. You know, you can be unlucky, they turn spin. A black swan event is the a parachutist jumping out of a plane, his parachute not opening. But the black swan event is the, is Donald Trump playing golf below and the parachutist lands on top of him. That is a black swan. It's, it's where it's basically it's impossible to calculate that second derivative. It, it's 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 that is a black swan. We so a pandemic by its nature is not a. We we, we know there are pandemics every ten to twenty years. There are major ones every fifty or sixty. We know that. Um, so it's not a black swan event. It is something that if if you study history and you go back to what can happen that you, you, there's, there's a pretty standard playbook for it. You know, now the things we don't know is, you know, was this gonna be like SARS um, and, and generally be con confined to a particular region of the globe or, or was it gonna be different? Was it gonna be like the 1918, you know, um, Spanish flu? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we didn't know what we did know. And hopefully that this goes to your second point, you know, the idea and how you structure it. When, I, you know, when the Chinese started isolating 400 million people, you go, hang on a second, you know, they don't do that because they've got nothing better to do. They do it because something serious is going yep. on. Yeah. Um, and look, I'm, I'm neither a China basher nor a China friend, but you know, they, they're smart. And like I said, when they locked down 400 million, you know, I thought, hmm, and actually, I, I have I, I looked at the charts um, a few months ago. It was that the, the S and P was making literally was making all time highs. But you know we know the supply chains. You know the, the the everything these days is global. You know computer manufacturing. The chips come from Taiwan. A lot of even you know high end technology stuff comes from China. It just did not seem credible to me that with 400 million people being and, and, and growing, that this was going to be able to be kept under control. But you know, the flip side to that, if I was wrong, how much could I lose? Well, in fact, the S&P was at a, pretty much at its all time high. So I thought, you know what, I'll, this, this is not a bad trade to put on. I can put a relatively tight stop on it. I can buy a few puts um, and I can sit back and, and wait and, of course, you know, we, we know it's now history and um, and we know what happened. You know, I, I, I caught the first leg. I totally missed the reflation trade very frustratingly. And actually, that in a way was the easy trade. The, the, the down move was the more difficult one. So um, I'm, I'm still I still harbor a bit of annoyance with myself to this point. I, mean, I, I actually thought the crisis was so bad that even the Fed chucking the kitchen sink at it wouldn't resolve it. I, I was wrong, basically. Um, yeah, you know, look where we are now, making new, all new flights. <laughs> right. And did you get to play sort of your, you know, you described an inside the house of money that, you know, going long euro dollar futures, which, which in essence is just betting on lower interest rates. Now, did you get to place that as well? Or did you just stick to trading the S&P? Actually, I probably made 20, 30% of my, of my returns was the S&P. The balance was actually in Fed funds, which is, is one of my favorite contracts. And it was, again, it was a no brainer. I think as this started, we were around 2%, you know, and, and, and those contracts were basically went to zero. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a 200 basis point move. It's not bad. Got it. So, you know, if, you were starting today, for example, you know, how would you go about learning to trade? And, you know, uh, when we were talking off uh, record, you know, you were mentioning that someone who wanted to trade currencies, you know, should look into, for example, interbank rates and money market rates as the key to trading. So could you go more into what you meant there? 
I that actually was in reference to, to more to crises. It, when a crisis starts brewing, and I'm thinking, you know, bank the, the pound breaking out the ERM back in when was it ninety two uh, ninety two. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the kind of rates you need to look at. Actually, and interesting enough, COVID blow up um, was the same thing. If you started looking at what was happening to, that's why the Fed started offering swap lines. You know, when when you see liquidity suddenly drying up, you know there's a big problem, and you want to look at the the financial plumbing. And that's actually the interbank interbank rates, and actually the shorter dated stuff, the overnights, the Tomnex and FX. Um, but it tells you where the stress is in the system. Um, but th- this is this is crises for macro and prop. I think you you know you've got to have a game plan. This is it's a, it's a it's a form of diagnosis, I guess. You know, it's 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 taking the temperature. Um, you know, doing the blood test. That's it, it's additive, but. This will help give you confidence or add confidence to your to, to the trade that you're putting on, um, and you know that's that's part of the game. You know when you have the high confidence, just having your own high confidence isn't enough. You know you want to add to that. So if you want to double your position or triple it or add to it, you you've got to have a good underlying reason to do that. Other than I think, I think this is a great trade, and and so I think it's you know it's. it's Putting parts of the pieces of the puzzle together as they as they fall into place, and they mm-hmm. become additive, it should make you more confident. And you see the price moving your way as well. Got it. That actually, is pretty critical. <laughs> so you know, how did you go about actually you know researching and finding ideas you know while you were at Goldman Sachs? So would it just be say for example you know reading say the Wall Street Journal or reading the Economist or you know how did you go about finding you know tradable ideas? Um, I'm not sure, you know, reading is helpful. History, reading history is helpful. Yeah, we, you know, we read the papers and we were spending 13, 14 hours a day at the desk reading. I, I, you know, we, we hear these days about the, the poor analysts who are, you know, doing PowerPoint. We, we didn't have to do that, but we read a lot. We filled in time. The, you know, the reality is that Prop trading, when you're looking, certainly I consider myself like a, an event trader. You know, if they're only happening three or four times a year, you're doing nothing for a, for a long period of time. Okay, so you're, you're trying to see, is, is an event coming? You know, are there stresses somewhere in the world? Um, mm-hmm. You know, one, one I can think of was actually was, you know, the creation of the euro. Um, the political will in Europe, in, in Europe had always been incredibly great, and not so much in the in the UK, like I said, but certainly in Europe. And if that was going to happen, it was clear that you know Italian bond yields at over a thousand basis points over Germany, they were going to converge. They would have to converge by definition. So that you know that would be that was a thesis. Okay, let's look at it. And actually, shock horror, you actually began many years before the actual launch in 2000, you saw, saw that conversion. I thought, well, either it's going to have to converge to pretty close to zero, or this thing isn't going to happen. So that's, you know, that's an idea, you can test it even six years, five years beforehand. Um, and then and then you go, okay, how do I construct this trade? And there are you know, there's always a thousand different ways to construct a trade. Um, and again, that's just putting bits of parts of the puzzle together. And as those pieces drop in, you go, hey, actually, this this is a nice trade. I'm going to add to it. I'm going to add to it in a slightly different way. Um, you know, and the beauty of derivatives is, again, as long as you avoid the make sure you don't have anything that's illiquid. <laughs> <laughs> take the other side, be the guy who's going to be the beneficiary of that illiquidity. Um, you can construct very interesting things, you know, I'm, um, and you can take other examples actually where they're not big picture, they're not three year or four year trades. Um, you know, I, I, I got a lot of criticism actually for the, um, the, the, the Twin Towers and I, I felt somewhat unfairly, you know, I, I, I watched that, I 
guessed that it was a terrorist attack. The US economy wasn't doing particularly well at the time. Um, and, and I did my go-to trade. I bought Euro dollars um, on the basis that I just thought if, if this really, if it is a terrorist attack, people are not going to be wanting to go out to shopping malls in the US. Um, they're going to be staying at home and you know, the likelihood is the Fed's going to cut rates because that's what the Fed does. That's its Pavlovian response. You know? <laughs> like I say, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. You know what? I'd like very simple trades that are liquid. And what was interesting that day, and actually for about 36 hours, those contracts hardly moved. They moved, I think, two or three basis points. And then they really started rocketing. Um, and they, they didn't go up they didn't rally the rates didn't rally because i was buying they it was because the fed cut interest rates yeah you know what it was look it was it was a terrible event but you know there there are terrible events there are great events we i was was employed to to capture market moves for whatever reason you know the the covid's been you know it's been awful but does that mean i should stop trading because of covid should mean that everyone should stop trading because of COVID. You know, that's it's 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 not really a, a logical, legitimate argument to make. I think so. And you know, one of the things you know, one of the things that I found interesting in your last answer was this idea of you know trade construction. And you know, may uh, could you give us an uh, an example of a trade? You know, where the construction of the trade actually made sort of a big difference to the risk return profile. And could you give us some tricks and tips on you know, how to express trades a lot, trades better, you know, for better returns? Well, I'll answer that in reverse. Um, the construction of a trade, I think, has to depend on your own trading style. I mean, I, you know, I, I have a way of constructing trades, but they work because of the level of risk I'm willing to take, the amount of movement, and everyone is different. You know, I'll go, I'll, Peter is one of the most disciplined traders I know, probably the most disciplined trader I know. And Peter Brandt, mm -hmm. um, he puts incredibly tight stop losses on his trades and he's mechanical about it. He's not emotionally involved in any of his trades. He knows that 60, I don't know what the number is, you, you probably do, of his trades are gonna fail. And I know that my hit ratio is actually pretty low. It's, it's certainly a lot lower than Peter's. You know, I, I probably kick two to three trades out of 10. Um, and because I know that my construction of the trades will reflect that some people will, you know, well, they'll be telling you they get nine out of 10. They're probably fibbing. Um, the reality is if you can get 50, 50, you're doing, I think you're doing incredibly well actually. And then if, you, if you're 50 50 okay you, you're toy costing but then it's about risk management you 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 cut the losers quickly i know you know everyone knows this you you let the winners run it is difficult it's easy to say it's very difficult to do the beauty in constructing some kind of derivative trade you can you can kind of inbuild that now if you get too complex you're going to end up never making money but you know, it could be a, it could be a simple option. It could be a bunch of um, embedded call options, diff different timelines or different strike ratios, and then you can start doing fancy things. You can start putting knockouts in them. You can start having expanding knockouts, knock ins. I you know, if it gets too complex, it won't work. Um, so to, you know, to me, it's a combination really, and, and you have to find. The construction that works with your style um and actually you haven't asked the question but you know this to me is critical there is there are, there's a thousand and one books on how to trade and there's some very good ones there's some average ones and there's some and frankly most of them are complete and utter rubbish but you have to find your own style you can't copy you know i'd i'd love to trade like stan druckenmiller trades but Hey, I'm never going to be able to, because he's Stan Druckenmiller, and trying to copy or, or imitate someone else's style is actually like imitating pretty much anything else in life. It's probably not going to work, or 
or, or figure it out, you know, think of it as art, you know, you have to find your style and you have to work at it and you have to perfect it. And mm -hmm. yeah. the results, you know, the beauty of this business is the results are there at the end of each day in black and white. There's no lying. There's no, ooh, you know, and, and saying, ah, you know, the market didn't do what it should have done and it wasn't right and it wasn't fair. And, you know, no, you're lying to yourself. So the numbers tell you what you need to know and you should listen to them. Got it. My numbers told me I should have packed. I should have packed it in seven or eight years. I should have packed it in nine years ago. I packed it in seven years ago. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. So could you could you also talk about so uh, you know well one person that you mentioned was Stan Druckenmiller who learned from George Soros and you know Soros in his book The Alchemy of Finance which was written you know very very long time ago talks about how you know it was mostly speculators that you know would drive these markets especially towards the end of trends uh, you know when you focus on currency markets so could you talk so do you think that you know how much is actually driven by short term speculative flows versus long-term macro fundamentals? Um, again, I can only talk with regard to speculative flows from when I was active. And in certain events, yes. I think in certain markets, currencies being won in, in relatively illiquid currencies, um, speculators, then we were talking in terms of, you know, I don't know, five to 20 billion. You know, these days, that's, it's a drop in the ocean. You know, the Bank of England went under, those are the kind of numbers we were talking about. Perhaps it might have been 30 billion, but they're, it's pretty small beer, actually. Um, and if you look at the US Treasury market, even going back 30 years, no, you, you couldn't. The speculators could not move that market. It's too big. You know, we, you know, the story of the Hunt brothers trying to corner silver, that was an illiquid market, you know, and, and, it looked like they were going to do it, but taking on a regulatory regime is not generally a good idea. So um, speculators may give impetus for, you know, some percentage of the move. I, 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 my guess would be these days it's less relevant unless it's in something very liquid. Um, in terms of, you know, the macro picture that in many ways hasn't changed you know we, we talked about covid you know that was about as macro as you're going to get it was it is it was a global pandemic and the outcome the pro the, the 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 probability was heavily skewed i in my view to a particular outcome it was a great risk reward trade actually on both of them you know the the down move and the up move um you don't always catch them all. I didn't. I think a lot of people caught the reflation trade, and you know, great. That's a good macro trade. You know? Got it. So, uh, so you know, one of the other aspects of trading currencies was focusing on the tape and focusing on tape reading. So, could you? Uh, you know, talk a little bit about you know what you would look for in the tape when actually trying to confirm a trade. And you know how that has changed over the years. Okay, I mean you've mentioned the tape. I think this probably goes back to our, our off-the-record conversation. You know, reminiscences of a stock operator where where he's that's all they had actually they didn't have any screens. So I, I I kind of referred to the tape in the sense in those days looking at price. Um, and and again, I'll go back to how we kind of started this. You know, when I was at City, and you know the the dolly end trade would say get me calls and there'd be 30 people in the room and they'd be, they'd be you know, the first, it, they'd, what you do is shout out the price and the size. I can't remember which way round it was. It would probably be, you know, um, zero, five and 10. And someone else would scream out, oh, two, oh, seven in 20. And someone else would shout out, it'd be the Russian, it'll be 95, five and 100. And, and that, maybe meaningless to someone, but what it's telling you is all the, the prices should have all been pretty similar. Suddenly someone very aggressively has marked the price lower in a large amount. Okay, mm -hmm. that, That's the equivalent of watch, suddenly watching something move in the tape. That guy knows something. Okay, You, you don't quote outside the range in a large amount 
as a punt because you know five pips and a hundred cable is fifty thousand quid. So it's um, it's it's th th these are large numbers. Um, so that's what I meant by looking at the tape. Price tells you some discrepancies in price, and it was clearer and easier then, going back thirty years. These days, I mean, everything is so commoditized. You know, the electronic platforms. I think you see less because of the depth. Um, now I know, and I haven't seen these things for quite a few years, but you probably get, you probably see it in crypto. I don't know if you see it in FX where you can see size outside of the current price. So let's say cable is, I don't know, these days, I guess it's quoted a pit wide, you know, so it's one, two or zero, one in let's for argument's sake, 50, 50 million quid aside or 20 million doesn't really matter. And if you can see the breakdown, so 20 pips away from that, perhaps there's there's 300 million on the offer and only 50 million on the bid. That gives you some idea of depth, but that is, that's what these are logarithmic guys doing. You know, they're, they're, they're pushing it to the weak side. And trust me, there, there's so many of them with such size that it's a pretty efficient market. You know, the price is not bad unless there's an event that moves it. So would that mean that, uh, so let's say, you know, there's a Russian guy who, you know, underprices everyone else. So would that mean you take a short position or, you know, how would your thinking process go from there? I'm just okay. curious. I have, to, I have to go back, you know, in those days, and I it won't mean much to, to, to many of your listeners, but, you know, the Russians were basically the largest um, players in the foreign exchange market. Um, I mean, they were huge. They, 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 they owned it, basically. Um, and I mean, you'll laugh, actually, this is true. They used to scan the trading room at Citibank for bugs once a week because people were absolutely convinced the only reason they were so good is because they bugged every single trading room. <laughs> and you exactly what everyone else was. I mean, you laugh, actually, I can say this now, but that is absolutely true. They used to scan the dealing room for bugs once a week. Um, I think, that, you know, they were good because they were aggressive. Um, and, and actually the guys who were doing it for them were good. Um, but it's a different one. I mean, that stuff just simply doesn't happen anymore now, unless someone knows. But again, you know, usually the only reason a huge currency transaction, you know, let's say it's a hundred billion, you know, you know the size of companies is because of, there's a takeover of a, an American company by a Norwegian company. So they know there's gonna be, and the Norwegian company is predominantly based in Switzerland or somewhere. I'm just making this up as I go along. So people guess there's going to be a Swiss franc dollar trade at some point. But, you know, the, again, with derivatives these days, those sort of things can be so easily laid off or spread out. It becomes more difficult. But it's, it, again, it's simple, different nuance. You know, I, I assume that people these days do their homework and, and understand, you know, how these things can or may pan out. And it's not always entirely obvious. It was simpler, I think, in my day. But it was simpler because computers didn't really exist. Email didn't exist. I mean, this is, you know, they didn't, we didn't have mobile phones. I mean, I, I talked to my kids about this and they look at me in complete astonishment. And go, <laughs> what, what do you mean you didn't have a mobile phone? The first mobile phone I got, I think, was in 1989, 1990, and it was the size of a brick and I only worked in London. Um, yeah, so you know, it's, times have changed. <laughs> Got it. So, to basically wrap up the podcast, could you talk about you know your best trade ever? Uh, you know, when you were at Goldman Sachs, and could you talk about how you found it? Now, my best trade ever was leaving the business seven years ago. <laughs> and I, I don't really want to talk about my uh, my best trade. You know, it, it's. Or at least like another trade that you know was not the pound yen one. Yeah, but no, that wasn't my best trade by a long shot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, favorite trades. Oh, actually, yeah, here's one. Actually, it's it's, uh, it's not it is, it's not in the book either. It was interesting enough. It was it goes back to ERM and the ERM breaking up. But this isn't the classic. I was short pounds, and although I I, I was short some pounds. The, the trade actually I, I put on as we, 
we went into the crisis, i.e. perhaps in the depths of it, so on the day or two days before, is I started buying way, way out the money, um, short sterling calls. Um, and these were, my memories, you know, we're talking 30 years ago, odd years ago. Um, they were OTC, so over, over the counter options, and I bought them from bearings. And these guys were selling, I'd, I'd have to go back, actually look at the interest rates. I don't want to put a number on it, whether, whether it was, they put rates up to 11 or 12% trying to defend the pound. But I was buying calls about a month and three months away duration, I struck at about 8%, 9%. And they were selling me these things. The vol was ridiculous. It was, I know, they were, I, I can't even remember. We're talking 40, 50, 60% vol. But, but but the the actual cost was was almost negligible. So I was hoovering these things as, as fast as I could. And and the logic was quite simple. I, one, I thought the pan was going to break. And secondly, you know, the reason it was going to break is because the UK economy was in trouble. And you jacking up rates in, into a declining housing market is not a recipe for success. <laughs> And as we know, you know, if, if the Fed always backstops the equity market, I'll tell you, there's something I've learned in the UK is the government always backstops the housing market. So I thought, I said, as soon as this crisis is over, they're going to be slashing rates. And they did. And the, it, was, it was a great, and I, I put it as, a, as, as a, a trade that springs to mind. Two reasons. Um, it was very simple. It was, again, no rocket science. And it actually, you know, kind of meshed with all these, you know, crisis in the US, buy euro dollars, buy Fed funds. Boy, it's not difficult. But of course, rates have to be a little bit higher than zero to make money in that environment. And actually, it ticked all my, my boxes at that point. Also, you know, I was long the option. I bought a lot of them, but at a ridiculously low price. Um, and the, the macro backdrop was on my side. Now, one of the reasons I like this trade, I like talking about it, is I actually did, it, I, I think it was probably one of the highest percentage return trades I ever did. But I made a huge mistake because I got out of the trade after about a month. Um, and I, I actually honestly can't remember my percentage return. I remember my PL return, but I, you know, that's, I, it's, it's, it's not polite to talk about those things. If I'd held on to that position for another, well, actually I actually held it to expiry for three months, I would have made three to four times as much. So sometimes, you know, you've, this is being the pig, you know, just sitting there going, you know, this is just going to get better. But hey, it, it was a very satisfying, I enjoyed it. It was simple. I like simple trades, actually. I don't like complex trades because I'm Got a simple. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Any closing thoughts? Uh, uh, on the world or in general? Anything. Um, I, th I think we're, to, in fairness, I've thought this for a number of years. You know, I think we're getting close to an inflection point in terms of the world economy, stock markets. You know, we've got interest rates at zero or below. We do have yields backing up somewhat. Um, I own no equities. Uh, no desire to, um, not at these levels, which, and it, you know, I'm, who knows, and it may well rally another 10, 20, 30%. I will not be participating. I do own commodities. Um, you know, the markets still fascinate me. They, they perplex me just as much as they ever did. Um, but I think that we are at extreme levels. You know, do, do I, does that mean it can't get more extreme? I've just said no, but you know, is it a time thing? I, I think within the next five years, we're gonna see a pretty major um, reckoning, shall we say. But um, I am known to be something of a perma bear and I'm happy to be. <laughs> you know, and the funny thing is, I'm a, a perma bear in the, with a 35 year career where, where basically <laughs> has only ever gone up. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Christian. It was awesome having you. Sri, thank you very much and, and good luck. <laughs>